Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, Director of Special Projects at The Block. Very excited to be in studio with you today and to have on the other side of the mic, our guest, Brian Roddick at GSR. He's He wears many hats. We were going through it before we turned on the mics, but I guess a large part of your rivet is um, internal and external uh, research at the firm. So maybe walk us through uh, your remit and your background. I know that you joined the firm about three years ago from traditional finance, like so many of us, uh, covering financial stocks at hedge funds. It's it's probably a bit of a, I mean, I'm sure you've gotten used to it now, but I'm sure that was quite the transition. Walk us through your role and and your background. Appreciate you taking the time to join us. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Frank. And just wanted to say thank you for having me on. Uh, I am a longtime listener and The Scoop is certainly in my favorite podcast list. And so I feel like I've been listening to you for years. Um, so it really is a true honor. So thank you again. Um, yeah, I, I guess like I'll give a super brief background for those who are not familiar with GSR, but we're one of the largest trading firms in digital assets. We were founded over a decade ago by ex-Goldman Sachs commodity derivatives experts. Um, we consider ourselves to offer the best of both worlds, so very crypto native, but we also try to port in best practices from TradFi. Um, we also try to do things the right way. Um, we really have three businesses. One is market making, so we sit on exchanges like Coinbase and Binance, uh, and we quote bids and asks. And it really positions us well in the center of the crypto ecosphere because liquidity is the lifeblood of the technology. Um, our other big businesses include OTC derivatives. Um, we are a principal, not an agent, so we can do things in larger sizes, longer durations, um, unique structures like APOs that most others can't do. And then mm -hmm. uh, our last business is really venture investing. And so we've committed mm -hmm. over $125 million of the firm's own capital into different projects and then we partner with our portfolio companies um, and help them out in a variety of ways but um, especially around uh, trading and liquidity and then yeah me i joined gsr three years ago um, initially started out doing research for the federal reserve as part of the monetary policy process decided i did not want to become an economist wanted to move into finance um, made my way to different hedge funds like Citadel and Ballyesney, where I managed a book of bank stocks, always in a long, short construct um, as part of a larger financials book. And it was really some of the banks that are unfortunately no longer around um, that were the fiat on off ramps for crypto that got me into uh, digital assets. And that's when I went down the rabbit hole. Um, feel like I understand traditional finance pretty well and decided that this is the future. Um, it will probably take decades, but this is where things are headed towards uh, and wanted to be a part of it. So was fortunate enough to join GSR about three years ago, um, joined crypto full time. Um, and really, I had our fundamental research effort. Um, so I do research really for two purposes. The first is to demonstrate thought leadership externally. So there is a ton of internal knowledge about crypto. Um, and we hadn't always done the best job of, you know, letting the market know that. And so that's one of my remits. Um, so if you go to gsr.io backslash insights, we produce everything from daily market updates to in-depth reports. We publish it through a variety of partners such as Bloomberg and others. Um, so that's one. And then the other half of my time is really spent on research for internal business initiative purposes. And so I had our um, mining initiative to try to help miners manage their risk. Uh, I sit on our investment committee. I meet with a bunch of different projects and protocols for due diligence purposes and also to offer thoughts on the competitive landscape or help them with tokenomics. So really keeps me busy, but um, I've really enjoyed every, every minute of it. How is, how is examining or conducting fundamental research on bank equities different from tokens, I guess, specifically within decentralized finance? Is, is the job mostly the same or what idiosyncrasies within crypto and, and pertaining to tokens make it 
maybe a bit more of a Herculean effort? Yeah. Um, oh gosh, there's a lot I can think of. Um, so when I was on the buy side in at different hedge funds, I covered about 30 stocks and they were pretty much all banks. And so, mm -hmm. you know, bank balance sheets are pretty darn homogenous. And so, you know, my mandate is to cover all of crypto. There's so many different subsectors. It moves so much faster than banks. Um, so in that sense, like you have to be running the entire time. So that's one thing. Um, I actually think like the skills and um, being able to really dig in deep and like basically learn how to learn and teach yourself stuff um, really translate well. I think the one thing uh, in addition that also really stands out is um, when you think about prices. So traditional equities really move much more on the fundamentals. So if you think about it, you can decompose a stock price into two different components, like forward earnings and then the multiple that the yeah. market describes to those earnings. Um, and the way I always tried to generate alpha um, in traditional equities is it's much harder in my view to predict like the multiple that the market will ascribe to it and much easier to dig a bit harder, kind of build the mosaic and understand where forward earnings will be better than mm -hmm. the market. Um, and I actually think it's the other way around in crypto. So like just because an L2 has the best tech out there doesn't mean they're going to be an end game winner. And things move much more based on the narrative and sentiment than uh, traditional equities do. So when you start to think about prices, you have to really keep that in mind. So how do you how do you model stuff like that? These are things that maybe are far less important than in, in equities. It's less about the earnings, more about memetics and other weird things, whether or not there's a narrative that can serve as a tailwind. How do you how do you sort of form uh create formulas around that something intangible like a like memetics or something yeah I, I think that it's less quantitative a bit more qualitative so like on the buy side i'd have my earnings model and you know i could come out to the penny you know whether or not like a bank's gonna beat or miss wasn't always right but you know it was like very quantitatively determined and here it's much more qualitative and just kind of having your ear to the ground. And so mm -hmm. like understanding that, like, hey, I'm on crypto Twitter. Everybody's talking about Celestia like this is one or two years ago and knowing like, hey, there's this thing called this modular blockchain, you know. And so we wrote about that in early 2022 is one of the big upcoming narratives. And, you know, turns out we were early because it wasn't really until they went live that, um, you know, folks started to really catch on to this narrative. But I feel like it's just having your ear to the ground, mostly seeing what folks are talking about. And then the other thing that I would point out, too, is that even though I think like predicting the fundamentals are easier than, you know, predicting what sentiment will be, um, I also think the crypto markets are way less efficient. And so there will be these known catalysts in the future that, uh, the tokens actually don't react to until they actually come to fruition. And I have so many examples of this. And so like one of the uh, quintessential ones is really Facebook with its name change. So there were so many media articles that Facebook was going to change its name to something related to metaverse um, about 10 days before they actually did it. And the metaverse related tokens didn't do anything for those 10 days. And it wasn't until Facebook officially changed its name to Meta that all the metaverse related tokens, you know, really rallied five to 10 X. And, you know, you could say the same thing with the L2 trade and Dan Kuhn coming like Ethereum's next upgrade. And everybody knew that that was happening in one H this year. And it wasn't until the ETH devs actually announced like the Dan Kuhn testnet schedule that you saw like names like optimism and Arbitrum really rally 70% plus over the next few days. So in that sense, you know, it you know, there's an argument for investing in tokens being easier than in traditional finance. Mm, interesting. So in in terms of it being easier, is it easier is, is that is that why we sort of see um is is it easier is it sort of there's more of a level playing field for for retail um and and maybe in some respects they have an advantage over institutions 
because of that? Yeah, I think in TradFi, you just have so many eyes on each of these stocks that any new information kind of gets incorporated almost immediately. And in crypto, mm. you know, you don't really have that. Um, like Bitcoin right now is up 10% uh, over the last 24 hours. I personally think that was because of Eric Balanchunas's tweet on like what uh, Bitcoin ETF AUM could become. So right now they're at 40 billion. He said that within two years, it could overtake gold's 90 billion. Obviously, like if the Bitcoin ETFs have gathered about 6 billion of assets and it moved the price from, you know, mid 40s to mid 50s, people are now pulling some of that forward. But you really saw Bitcoin, you know, didn't react immediately to his tweet and really just gradually moved up over the last 24 hours. And, you know, there's other factors at play. So you've seen a bunch of liquidations that are happening. Um, you've got other positive signs that we could talk about for both BTC and ETH. Um, but yeah, I really think that things are not incorporated into prices nearly as quickly, uh, in crypto. Mm, that's interesting. So what are your thoughts on the market right now? And to what extent is macro playing a role driving the narrative? Is it really, um, is it really just these ETFs coming online, the happening? What are some of the forces at play? Yeah. So I've always thought it really depends on your time horizon. So over the long run, crypto is going to move with the fundamentals. Um, those fundamentals, even though they will ebb and flow based on whether we're in a bull or bear market, they're generally trending positively, um, like adoption and usage is increasing. Capital is coming back to the ecosystem. The number of developers, especially um, established developers, continues to increase. And so all these things point a very positive picture for crypto prices over the long run. And in the short run, in my mind, you know, it's really driven by both the macro and then crypto specific catalysts and risks. And so macro, the biggest thing right now um, is really what happens with monetary policy. I think central banks are much more likely to cut rates than to raise rates. And mm -hmm. um, we've actually looked into this. Um, Bitcoin performance actually has very high correlation with global liquidity as approximated by global M2. And, you know, global liquidity will probably be increasing in the future. And so Bitcoin, I mean, it should be supportive of Bitcoin's price. Um, and then when you look at different crypto specific catalysts and risks, you know, you've got a bunch of building that's been happening for the last two years. And so you'll see a bunch of dApps and infrastructure actually going live You've got retail that doesn't feel like they're fully back in yet. You've got a bunch of progress with the ETFs. You've got global elections and the potential for sensible regulations. You've got a bunch of different BTC and ETH specific catalysts, like the halving, restaking, a bunch of others that we could get into. And then it's really actually kind of hard for me to think of different risks. Um, like you've got potential where well, you've got Mt. Gox repatriation. But even mm -hmm. that is going to end in October, and then that overhang will be removed. You've got the potential for a centralized exchange or a stablecoin going insolvent, but kind of feels like the biggest ones, you know, much less of a risk right now. You've got the potential for like the U.S. government legal wins or enforcement actions. So the industry is doing quite well right now with respect to that. So, you know, really kind of feels to me like these positive catalysts are tilted Um much more strongly than these potential risks. You hit on something that I was talking with some members of my team about this morning, the the extent to which retail maybe has not fully gotten back into the market. And there are a few metrics that we pay attention to here at The Block, including uh, Coinbase's ranking on the App Store. Um, it's, been, it's been ticking upwards, but it's still um, quite a way away from where it was at the top of the last cycle. I think um, on the on the App Store right now, it's I can check because I wrote about it in the newsletter today. Let's see if I can pull it up here. Um, it's still in the in the three hundreds, right? And I think it was number one, um, at least in the finance uh, category of the App Store back in the peak of twenty twenty one. And there's other things that you can look at as well, such as 
um, just pulling it up here. Um, if you look at Google search volumes, um, they peaked at 100 in 2018, got close to 75 in 2021, and are still only at 25. And some of these social metrics, app usage metrics, give a sense of how engaged retail is with the market. And it seems like we're, whilst we're down from all-time highs by, let's call it 20%, the sort of engagement from retail is down um, an order of magnitude, as well as volumes, right? So we're not too far from peak Bitcoin prices, but volumes are a fraction of what they were. Um, so what does that tell you? What does this mean for um, this rally and, and whether or not this, this bull cycle is actually a bull cycle with some legs? Yeah, um, I think it's just another quiver um, in our backpack to where, you know, could really push prices back towards an all time high and much further to the extent that retail does actually come in and start to engage like they did in 2021. Um, I think you hit it on the head, naming just about all the major metrics that, you know, we use to monitor whether retail's back or not. Um, I think another one is just like how many of my normie friends are asking me about mm -hmm. crypto. Um, I've basically gotten zero calls, um, whereas back in 2021, I was like the most popular friend in my friend group. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it really does feel like that when retail comes back, you know, it can happen in a big way and push prices up. Um, so, yeah, I think that that is one big potential positive catalyst that has yet to play out. Mm. And what are some of the other positive catalysts? I think uh, one thing that maybe is overlooked is 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 the bitcoin etfs and how not how long i guess how long that story will take to play out right um you have fidelity and canada suggesting or already having within certain types of portfolios um a construction where you have one to three percent of bitcoin allocated we had um a recent guest come on to describe the, the ETF says effectively a, uh, let me pull up the quote because I thought it was funny, a multi-decade TWAP of buy only. <laughs> Can we walk through that catalyst and, and how long it will take to play out? Have you noticed um, any impact or, or changes in, in the market dynamics because of these funds? I mean, you mentioned Eric Balchunas's tweet, the fact that I don't want to, I'll digress eventually, but this feels, the market reacting to news or to tweets in that way um, is, is something that feels or brings me back to the previous cycle. Yeah. If you ask me whether or not folks are um, too aggressive or not aggressive enough on what AUM would look like in you know one or two years? I would say that they're certainly not aggressive enough. Um, I, I just think like this is such a big opportunity. We've actually written reports about it and detailed all of this, but it's really three reasons why mm -hmm. I think like this opportunity is massive. Um, and so, really, the first is the size of the U.S. capital markets. So. Um, whether you're looking at FIC or equities, it dwarfs any other jurisdiction and the U.S. is over indexed to ETFs. So the size of the U.S. ETF market is 7 trillion versus Europe at 1.5 and Asia Pacific at one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just the sheer size alone should argue that, you know, you get a lot of AUM in these spot Bitcoin products. Um, number two is just the advantages for many folks over other vehicles. So they really do offer this unique combination of fees, transaction costs, liquidity, tracking error, and operational complexity. And so it's very easy for folks to add to a portfolio, not have to worry about custody or any of those other me measures. Um, and so I really think like this is a really great product for most people um, versus, you know, some others. Uh, and then really lastly is just looking at what happened with like gold ETFs. Um, mm -hmm. It's probably the best analogy. Really hard to know like what ultimate AUM will be in like a year or two because it is, you know, a newish asset class. But 
if you think about it, like gold has a relatively fixed supply, retail had difficulty getting access to it. And then um, I think State Street lost, launched the first gold ETF in 2004. It set records at the time with its launch. Um, I think right now, global gold ETFs hold 200 billion worth of gold and the price of gold has forexed um, since then. And so I think that just is a little bit of a potential preview of what could potentially happen to Bitcoin given these US spot Bitcoin ETFs. Raises an interesting question, which is what drives asset prices? Is it fundamentals or flows? Yeah, well, here, here, um, I think it's flows. And I think, well, it's a, it's a bit of the same. I mean, my thought is like, flows are somewhat part of the fundamentals. And like, if you came in with this view, um, well, one, I think you could have gotten into this trade early, right? So BlackRock um, filed for their spot ETF in mid-June. Um, and then Grayscale, I think it was late August, actually won their court case against the SEC. And mm -hmm. it really wasn't until late October that Bitcoin started to rally um, based on this ETF. So you could have gotten you know, ahead of it there. And then I think you could have looked at like an analysis and who knows, but you could have looked at some of the things we've been discussing and said like, hey, I'm going to take the over on AUM, especially once these GBTC outflows start to subside. And that should all else equal have a positive impact on price. And so to me, like flows would fit in the category of fundamentals. And I think like, it's obviously to say this is like after the fact, like Monday morning quarterback, but mm -hmm. I do think like this is just such a massive catalyst. And in my mind is the big, big reason of why Bitcoin price went from 25K to mid 50s now. And this happening that's coming, is it priced in? Mm, my best guess is that you might see a run up into the halving and then seeing it fade a bit after. Um, I think folks will say like, hey, Bitcoin typically, you know, has a positive catalyst with the halving and they'll try and get in, which will probably push the price up. I actually think that there's less of a fundamental reason for that to be the case versus the past. So in the past, the marginal increase in supply, uh, every time you had a halving, it was actually a pretty big difference. So mm -hmm. to put it, you know, quantitatively, like in 2012, the block reward went from 50 BTC down to 25 which equated to 16% inflation, moving to 8%. So that 8 percentage point decline in inflation is pretty substantial. And now in April, block rewards will go from 6.25 to 3.125 BTC, and inflation is just moving from 2% to 1%. So, you know, there's less of a fundamental reason for it to actually cause Bitcoin to rally. And I think you've actually seen that play out with each subsequent having having a smaller and smaller impact on the price of BTC. Yeah, because that inflation metric is is declining. How are miners hedging into that event? Yeah, we uh, don't, I mean, we've got a lot of the top miners onboarded with us and very candidly, we don't see them doing a ton. Um, part of the reason why they're a miner is they believe Bitcoin will go up. Um, it's also a nascent industry, so they haven't ported in best practices for more mature commodity producer industries. So I would say like what they're trying to do and like their version of risk management, which is certainly part of it, is to have a strong balance sheet so have and have access to capital. Um, number two, they're trying to make sure they have access to cheap electricity and having that locked up with power purchase agreements. And then they're trying to also have the most efficient rigs. I think nobody knows exactly how it'll play out. Um, obviously, the network hash rate has just continued to increase almost in a parabolic fashion. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, some of that will be forced to come offline from the least efficient miners. But I think the strategy for them is really, hey, let's have access to cheap capital, let's have the most efficient rigs, and then let's have the cheapest electricity costs out there and if we do all that, we're going to be one of the last ones standing and, you know, we can withstand no matter what happens. How, what other types of um, market participants are maybe um, emerging and ha having, or, you know, might have unique trading needs? Yeah. Um, 
you know, our OTC business, just as a byproduct of being one of the largest market makers, does work with a lot of different, um, I guess, projects uh, and and their foundations and and DAOs and mm-hmm. their uh, founders and stuff. So a lot of flow that we see comes from that. Um, you know, we also work with a lot of like institutional players and like very um, crypto native funds. Um, I'm actually not super close with like what's happening on our trading desk. So I'm not sure if there is like a, a new player who's now all of a sudden entering the crypto sphere. My gut is telling me that at least here in the U S um, it probably is not going to happen and have like, I guess, traditional asset managers and institutions come in in a big way and start to trade um, like altcoins until we have much more regulatory regulatory clarity um but uh yeah i'm afraid i don't have a great answer there so for the next six months what do you think you'll be paying the most attention to yeah uh to me the biggest driver of whether or not we go into a full bowl is uh whether or not an etf gets approved um happy to talk about that Um, for eth yeah, but I, I do think like it would have a positive impact on altcoins for sure. Um, and then also probably drag up Bitcoin as well. Um, not as much, but at least some. Um, so that to me is the biggest thing. Um, yeah, I could talk about that. Um, and yeah, I think just a lot of the catalysts that we've been talking about. Um, I mean, if there's these, if these, if there's these wins from Coinbase, and some of the other firms that have found themselves in, on the other side of the ire of the SEC. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things that, that are still uncertain. I think maybe have cap prices to some extent, that being one of them, and then the uncertainty around an ETF. If you get a win, if you get wins um, at a Coinbase, an ETF, I mean, that's those are two major catalysts, as well as also just the fact that this space lacks um, the leverage that existed in the previous cycle. You had about, you had Genesis, right, with a loan book of $20 billion or something in that ballpark. And a lot of that institutional leverage doesn't exist. So you, you have rising crypto asset prices against a backdrop of regulatory uncertainty, a lack of li- liquidity to an extent, as well as rising interest rates. And I guess like an ideal scenario would be all three of those being remedied. Um, And I don't think that the market has priced in any of those um, necessarily being solved. As of recently, you've maybe seen ETH ETF um, approval being being priced in with, with the recent rally, but I don't know if the market is sort of appreciating those other aspects as much i completely agree um i think it's really hard to actually um peg why like eth has been rallying i saw like one sell side report that said it did not have anything to do with like the potential for an ETF and was more due to denkun coming online um Mm. next month um you know and i also don't think that there's a lot of folks who are really digging in a ton i've seen a lot of folks say like the chances of an ETF approval are sub 50% but in my mind like they're not really digging into like why was the spot bitcoin etf actually approved like yes the uh, sec was kind of forced to approve it by the us courts mm-hmm. but really the key uh, the key reason was for this like light treatment of futures based and spot based ETFs was the fact that the correlation between futures and spot markets for Bitcoin was sufficiently high. And I think like that to me is going to be the key determinant of whether or not the SEC could potentially um, deny the ETH ETFs um, based on, you know, the correlation of ETH futures and spot markets. Um, and whether or not like that meets their definition of sufficiently correlated. Um, Coinbase actually released a letter in support of these ETH ETFs with their own correlation analysis. They actually found that ETH um, markets were more correlated than the Bitcoin markets. So I think that bodes well. Mm. Um, and then I think most folks think that even if 
like the SEC denies the ETF applications in May, they will probably get sued and it just becomes a 2025 event. Um, yeah, so I, I think like that's positive there. Um, the other thing too that we could talk about, I actually think like Eigenlayer is probably the most underappreciated potential positive catalyst for Ethereum for a bunch of reasons. Um, a lot of risks there too, but um, I think that's something that's not fully incorporated into ETH's price as well. There's a lot of uh, positive catalysts that we've outlined over the past 45 minutes. Yes. Any closing thoughts, sir? Um, yeah, not really. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it'll certainly be interesting to see what happens with uh, these ETH ETFs, what happens with uh, Din Kuhn, and then what happens with Eigenlayer. But in my mind, uh, there's a lot to like right now, even after this big run that we've had. Great. That's what that's what our listeners will like to hear. Appreciate you taking the time to join the program. Uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Of course. And The Scoop will be back for you again with another great guest. Have an awesome day.